Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here today, October 10th at noon, for our RN and Allied Health live lecture. A uh, few preliminaries and then we'll get started. If you are having any trouble at all with the connection, please call us 919-445-1000. You can also email us uncn at unc.edu. Uh, let's see, uh, we are you can find us on the web at unccn.org, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Instagram, lots of different locations, uh, but we do hope that you'll find us and uh, look at all the lectures that are coming up as well as all of our past lectures. Uh, I believe we have over 200 lectures now online. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and talk about Poll Everywhere for just a moment. Uh, this is how we uh, provide an opportunity to interact with you around the lecture. Uh, we'll have a, a polling question in just a moment, and then Dr. Morgan has several questions provided for you uh, throughout the lecture, and then you have an opportunity to ask questions right at the end. So in order to do any of that, you do need to join with Poll Everywhere, and you can do that in one of two ways. Uh, an easy way to do that is on any web browser, including a web browser on a smartphone. You can go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V, dot com forward slash U-N-C-C-N. So if you do that, you'll be able to see each poll as it comes up and then type in your questions when uh, that time is available. We also have lots of our listeners who use... Uh, the texting feature on their phone to join Poll Everywhere, that's very simple as well. You go to your, uh, however you would text, and you text to the number 22333, the letters UNCCN. So two, in the two section, you're going UN, uh, 22333, and then your message is UNCCN. Do that once, that will join you to the uh, Poll Everywhere tool and then you'll be able to respond to the questions including this one coming up now. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, you can do that next. Oncology professionals need to be aware of drug interactions because, and then there are four answers. Uh, if you believe that it's the first answer, you would put in an A and that's all cancer fighting drugs are extremely toxic. If you believe it's 90% of all adverse reactions to drugs result in nausea, you would put in B. If you think it's interactions between drugs always produce a positive response, you would put in C, and 20 to 30 percent of all adverse reactions to drugs are caused by interactions between drugs, then you would put in D. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today. So, uh, Dr. Katie Morgan, welcome. Glad to have you here today. Thank you. Let's see, we've got a little bit of information about you here. Okay. Uh, PharmD in oncology, uh, clinical specialist practicing in outpatient um, genitourinary oncology and neuro-oncology at the NC Cancer Hospital. Mm -hmm. Doing okay so far? Yeah. Okay, great. Received your Doctor of Pharmacy from the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. uh, completed both PGY1 and PGY2 residencies at the UNC Medical Center and a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Practice Advancement and Clinical Education. That's right. All right. What, what should we know about you that, that wasn't on the bio there? Well, that's all very job focused. So mm -hmm. I guess one thing to know about me is um, I'm a photography hobbyist. Oh, great. So I like to do photography in my spare time when I'm not taking care of my small children, which are three and ten months old. Wow. And um, when I'm not uh, at work. So that's just one thing I enjoy doing that's outside great. of those responsibilities. Very good. And do you do nature photography, portraits? Um, uh... A little bit of everything. Okay. I like um, architecture, photography, and I do take portraits of my kids, but they're easy to capture since great. I'm around them a lot. <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you so much. We're yeah. really happy to have you here. Yeah, no uh, let's take a look at that uh, poll and see what kind of responses we're getting. Okay. All right. Oh, well, uh, we're starting uh, to trend on B <laughs> right away here. So again, oncology professionals need to be aware of drug interactions because, and if you think this is A, all cancer-fighting drugs are extremely toxic, B, 90% of, of all adverse reactions due to drugs result in nausea, C, interactions between drugs always produce a positive response, or D, 20 to 30% of all adverse reactions to drugs are caused by interactions between drugs. Yeah. How are they doing? 
Doing great. A hundred percent got the right answer. So Excellent. we'll kind of get um, started into why, you know, all the details with that. Great. All right. Well, uh, understanding oncology drug interactions. So that's a perfect lead in. I'll pass the uh, controls thank over you to you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction. So uh, like Tim said, we'll be discussing oncology drug interactions today. And, you know, why don't we just go ahead and get started. So by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to discuss the importance of identifying drug-drug interactions in patients receiving cancer drug therapy. Um, we're going to go over the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic factors that are impacted by drug interactions. And then be able to kind of throughout the presentation, we're going to identify important interactions that are related to oncology and how to manage them. So cancer patients are at an increased risk of um, being exposed or potential, having potential drug interactions. They're on multiple different types of medications, including their cancer-directed therapy. And, you know, most potential drug interactions can be identified. Um, some of them oftentimes can't be avoided, so we're going to definitely talk about management of those as well. Um, and so from an oncology practitioner perspective, it's, it's important to be able to realize what types of drug interactions um, can happen, and also um, how to manage those interactions. So the prevalence is high in cancer patients. There's at least one potential drug interaction found in about 30 to 60 percent of ambulatory care cancer patients, and at least one found in 50 percent of patients receiving an oral anti-cancer drug. So um, we know that those are on the rise, and so it's pretty important to be able to, um, you know, realize that this is a big issue in cancer-directed therapy. And um, it's estimated that drug-drug interactions can cause about 4% of deaths in cancer patients. So um, with that, the current trends with oncology therapy right now is that oral anti-neoplastic agents are definitely on the rise. About greater than 25% of the medications coming out for cancer therapy today are oral medications. And the implications of that are that the daily dosing of these oral medications um, is a chronic daily dosing. So typically you don't have a, um, a course of treatment that you maintain on the medications for a very long time, more like a chronic condition. And with the um, addition of these new medications as well, you also tend patients, luckily, have longer survival. Um, so the patients are on these medications longer, they're living longer, so potentially they could develop more comorbidities um, that also need address with medications. So all of these things can definitely contribute to patients um, being exposed to potential drug interactions. There's also an economic burden with drug interactions. It's estimated that morbidity and mortality due to drugs costs about uh, hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Um, drug interactions, as we saw in the poll, contribute to about two, 20 to 30 percent of, ad, of um, adverse drug reactions. And if you think about that, if a patient has an adverse drug reaction, this can lead to increased clinic visits, um, ED visits, hospitalizations, also cost of interventions around that drug reaction, and um, potentially using other drugs to treat some of these conditions. So the cost for a drug interaction can be substantial. And drug interactions are also associated with a longer length and increased cost of hospitalization. Again, thinking about additional interventions that need to be made for patients who um, have are exposed to a drug interaction. So these are all um, economic burden that we can see from a drug interaction. And there are several different medications that are involved. Again, cancer patients have lots of different medications that they may need to take, the primary one being a chemotherapy or cancer-directed therapy. We have traditional chemotherapies or cytotoxic chemotherapies that um, can have drug interactions. We have our oral chemotherapy or oral directed therapies, and um, also hormonal agents that patients are on. And with those chemotherapy drugs, oftentimes patients need supportive care medications. So antiemetics, um, pain medications, and anti-infectives are just a few of the medications that are com common um, to cause potential drug interactions. And then, of course, patients have comorbidities, um, and so non-cancer-related medication, like anticoagulants, 
antihypertensive and anticonvulsants are also implicated in drug interactions. And then you have complementary and alternative medications. So lots of patients are very interested in um, taking herbal supplements. We'll touch on that a little bit at the end of the presentation, um, but it's really important to realize that although there is, um, um, these can be easily obtained over the counter, that doesn't mean they're benign medications and um, they do need to be assessed just like any other um, drug that the patient is taking. So risk factors for drug inter interactions in cancer patients, not surprising, is the number of drugs the patient is on. So um, the increased number of drugs the patient's on, the higher risk the patient will be to have a drug interaction. So each additional medication that a patient is on can increase the risk of a drug interaction by 40%. And that's pretty substantial. And um, it's also been shown that the use of at least eight drugs or more in a patient is associated with a greater potential for drug interactions. Another thing that has been identified is um, the use of over-the-counter medications. Um, this can increase your risk of a potential drug interaction by 44%. And it's always really important to make sure that you um, assess if a patient is taking over-the-counter medication because as we th see throughout the presentation, these can have um, strong implications in the effectiveness of um, chemotherapy. And some patients don't think of them as a, as a drug that needs to be reported because they just buy it at their um, you know, local pharmacy and it's not that big of a deal. So it is very important to make sure that we're assessing uh, for those as well. And then also the type of medication. So it has um, been shown that drugs for comorbid conditions are um, more likely to be implicated in a potential drug interaction versus something like a supportive care medication. But both definitely can um, come with, with complications. So um, each type of medication is very important to um, kind of assess. And so the you know, last piece that I just want to bring to the table is obviously the effects of the drug interaction on the patient. So chemothera the chemotherapy and oral um, anti um, neoplastic medications are, are narrow therapeutic index drugs. And basically what that means is that a small change in concentration can have a large impact on um, the exposure of the drug to the patient. So this could result in one, increased toxicity, um, two, decreased therapeutic effect if the exposure is decreased, or you could have a combined effect um, due to the two different drugs like causing the same type of physiological response. So this is what can end up leading to a patient having you know, an adverse drug reaction or suboptimal therapy um, because of the exposure, decreased exposure to the patient. So this brings us to our first case. Um, it's, uh, this is JM, he's a 58-year-old male who presents with, to clinic with newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer, um, planning to start on abiraterone and prednisone. Um, his past medical history is hypertension, diabetes, and osteoporosis. And home meds are listed here include aspirin, a statin, lisinopril, diltiazem, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, glyburide. Um, he's taking calcium and vitamin D twice daily, um, Tylenol for pain as needed, and his labs are within normal limits. So the question is, which one of the following increases JM's risk of drug interactions? Is it one, his diagnosis of prostate cancer, or A, sorry, um, B, his age, it was 58, C, the number of medications the patient is taking, <clears throat> or D, um, the number of comorbidities. Oh, and E, sorry, all of the above. All right. So if you take just a moment, please, to, uh, to put in what you think is, is the best answer, and these are anonymous, uh, but A, B, C, D, or E if you're texting, uh, and you can just select the answer if you're going off the website there. All right, how are we doing? Well, actually, um, the correct answer is C, the number of medications. So based on the data, um, we didn't really discuss that diagnosis was a huge risk factor for um, a drug interaction or age. There's actually data to show that age doesn't really um, have, play a large role in, um, 
increasing one's risk for drug interactions. Okay. And then also number of comorbidities. Now, the number of comorbidities can potentially come with an increased number of medications. Mm -hmm. But um, based on what was presented, the number of medications is the reason why um, JM's risk of drug interactions is high. Understood. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you to everybody who's participating in these polls. We yes. really appreciate it. Okay. So really we're going to start talking about what factors can be affected to cause some of these drug interactions. And two main um, uh, parameters that we look at are pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic factors that are associated with the medications. So pharmacokinetics is basically um, how the drug moves around the body. Um, we also call it, call it ADME. Um, which is absorption, distribution, metabol metabolism, and excretion. And a pharmacokinetic drug interaction is how one drug affects the other with one of these four parameters. So absorption is how the drug will get into the body. And um, this is most pertinent with oral medications and um, non -IV, other non-IV medications because um, IV medications don't need to be absorbed. Um, distribution, so how is the drug, um, where does it go and how does it get there? Metabolism is how the drug is broken down um, into um, compounds that can be easily excreted. And then excretion, so how does the drug leave the body? So we're going to kind of go through each one of these parameters and talk about how um, drug interactions can kind of come up with each different type of pharmacokinetic um, parameter. So the first one is absorption. This seems pretty simple. We want the drug to go from the site of administration, which could be oral, um, sublingual, um, rectal, any kind of absorption site, and then um, get how it gets into the blood circulation. We're going to mainly focus on oral because this is where some of the um, important drug interactions come up. Um, there's two kind of things that we think about with absorption drug interactions. The first one is efflux transporters. Um, so an efflux transporter, um, one is P-glycoprotein efflux pump, is actually in the GI tract, and it um, will, if a drug is a substrate for a PGP, I'll call it PGP from now on, efflux pump, then the pump actually pumps the drug back into the stomach, um, inhibiting it from getting into the bloodstream. And this is, um, you know, a common thing that happens with drugs, and the drugs when they're studied are, um, you know, the doses are escalated um, to uh, overcome this effect. So you can have drugs that actually inhibit this efflux pump. So that would end up allowing more drug than anticipated to be absorbed into the bloodstream. The other thing that can happen um, is that some medications do require a certain gastric pH to be absorbed. And so for proper absorption into the gut, patients need to, you know, take it on either empty stomach, um, not be a, um, take any acid suppressants and things like that. And that's a pretty common one for a lot of our oral um, antineoplastic medications. So it's something that comes up a lot that we need to counsel patients on because if somebody feels like they have indigestion, they might just go to the pharmacy and reach for something and don't realize that it could have consequences on the outcomes of their cancer. So one example of this is disatinib and acid suppression. So disatinib is a medication used to treat CML. It is an oral medication. Um, and it does have pH-dependent solubility, so it needs an acidic environment to be absorbed. Um, one study looked at um, healthy volunteers that were taking disatinib alone and compared it to taking disatinib, I mean, sorry, um, famotidine two hours after um, disatinib and then 10 hours before disatinib. And then the third arm was taking a, an antacid similar to Maalox, for example, um, uh, two hours before the medication and then at the same time as disatinib. And what they found was that if you took the um, famotidine or pepsid two hours after the disatinib administration, there was no difference between absorption when not taking anything. But if they took it 10 hours before, so taking before the administration of disatinib and then that's when your pH in your stomach would be affected, there was a 60% reduction in exposure to disatinib. And these concentrations in the body are very important for people, people to be um, respond to their cancer therapy. Um, when they looked at the 
um, antacid like the Malox. Uh, when it was taken two hours before, there was no difference in exposure to the medications, but taken at the same time, again, around 60% was decreased um, with um, the antacid administration. So the recommendations for desatinib, and this is similar for other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are, uh, are have pH-dependent solubility, is that H2 receptor antagonists and proton pump inhibitors should not be given with desatinib. And, and acids may be given if doses are separated from desatinib by at least two hours. So as long as they're not taking it at the same time as the desatinib, they are able to take it um, around the administration. So this kind of brings us to our second um, case, just making sure everyone's paying attention. So SC is a 67-year-old female diagnosed with CML. She takes desatinib 100 milligrams per day. She presents to clinic for follow-up and tells you she has been having burning in her esophagus, especially when lying down. And her friend says that omeprazole has helped her indigestion. So she went over the counter and bought some last week and she feels much better. Um, she has a history of osteopenia and asthma. Her home meds are pretty light. She just has um, vitamin D and a couple inhalers. And her labs are pretty normal for her condition right now. And so um, the question is, how would you advise SC about her current self-care for indigestion? And I know these are a little lengthy, but let me just, I just want to make sure that people can pull out the important um, concepts with this question. So A is discontinue omeprazole daily, I'm sorry, continue omeprazole daily and ensure she is taking it appropriately at 6 a.m. The second one B is discontinue omeprazole. This could decrease the absorption of desatinib and potentially decrease her ability to get to a major molecular response. Recommend Tums as needed, not taken with two hours of desatinib. C is discontinue omeprazole. This could decrease the absorption of desatinib and potentially decrease the ability to get to a major molecular response. Recommend famotidine, 20 milligrams twice a day. And lastly, D is discontinue omeprazole. This could increase the absorption of desatinib and cause hematologic toxicity. Recommend Tums as needed, not taken within two hours of desatinib. All right, how are they doing? They're doing great. Good, good. Definitely. So 100% of uh, you guys out there click the correct answer. It is B. So as we just discussed, it would decrease the absorption of desatinib, and the recommendation would be to use an acid not taken within two hours of desatinib. All right, well done. Okay, so the next pharmacokinetic parameter we're going to talk about is distribution. Um, so this is the process of transferring the drug from the blood circulation to target tissues. And a couple of things can be affected. Um, protein binding displacement is one, and um, tissue, tissue distribution. There are several different things that are um, can affect distribution, protein binding being one of them. Another is just like the size of the molecule, and lipophilicity can also affect how the drug is distributed throughout the body and what tissues it can get into. Um, Protein binding displacement is basically what happens when two medications are highly protein bound and they um, can displace one drug from the protein binding site and allow for more free drug to be in the circulation, which can increase the exposure of the, of the patient to the drug. So um, it's something that's important to consider for highly protein bound drugs. One example would be paclitaxel and warfarin. And I know warfarin, we don't use it as much anymore, but it is still relevant for um, many patients, especially patients who have renal dysfunction. Um, so paclitaxel is, and warfarin are both highly protein bound in the 90, almost 100% protein bound. And so after administration of paclitaxel, warfarin can be displaced from protein binding sites. And this would cause an increase in free warfarin concentration. And what that would do would be um, have an increase in, in the patient's INR. So what we would recommend in this scenario would be obviously monitoring warfarin um, to make sure that any dose adjustments with the INR would need to be made at the time. Um, now, a lot of these protein displacement um, uh, drug interactions 
are somewhat, can be somewhat theoretical and uh, clinical significance is not necessarily always seen. So if you do come across an interaction that is a protein binding interaction, you know, my recommendation would be um, more on a monitoring standpoint than um, a kind of avoidance of that because sometimes we do um, come across these interactions and, but as far as case reports, there hadn't been any real reports of increased adverse effects. But this is just an example of what can happen. Now, this was something that was published. Um, they did see in this scenario that a patient's INR was affected after paclitaxel um, administration. So it's always some, it's something to be aware of. I would say the clinical significance of a lot of these interactions is kind of hazy. So it would be um, something that we would want to monitor closely. So the next uh, pharmacope kinetic parameter, and I would probably say is most important for drug interactions, is metabolism. So metabolism is the conversion of drugs into compounds that are easier to eliminate. Um, and there's two different types of phases of metabolism. There's phase one, uh, which could be oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis, and phase two, which could be glucuronidation, acetylation, and sulfation. And drugs can undergo one of these or both. Um, they don't necessarily always undergo both um, processes. Um, but uh, the most important um, type of um, metabolism to understand for drug interactions is the oxidation with the cytochrome P450 enzymes. So this is one of the most important things to understand when we're discussing um, drug interactions. So when we're talking about cytochrome P450 enzymes, these are in enzymes involved in synthesis and breakdown of molecules. Um, they do... They do um, Undergo, provide oxidation, and so I have six of the cytochrome P450 enzymes listed there. Now, these six enzymes are responsible for about 90% of drug oxidation, and um, uh, cytochrome 3A4, sorry, is alone responsible about the metabolism of about 50% of drugs. So this is one of the most important enzymes that we kind of keep track of whether or not um, involved in drug interactions. And um, 3A4 is primarily located in the liver, but it does have a presence in the small intestines as well. And so drugs can be substrates for these enzymes. They can also be inhibitors and inducers of the enzymes. So if you have an um, enzyme inhibitor, um, you would see an increase in the drug concentration of the substrate that is being affected. And that's typically seen about immediately after drug administration. And then um, enzyme induction actually induces the enzyme to um, metabolize more than it typically would. And so if you have an enzyme inducer, this drug that was being affected by the enzyme inducer, the, it would have provide decreased exposure to the patient. And this typically takes several weeks after the start of the drug administration for induction to take place. And this is just a table um, that I put together. This is by no means comprehensive. I just wanted to give like a couple of examples of some common um, medications that are implicated in these type of enzyme drug interactions. So 3A4, um, azole antifungals, diltiazem, verapamil, amriodarone, and grapefruit juice. So this is where the grapefruit juice um, discussion comes up all the time because it can be a 3A4 inhibitor. So we don't want patients to be drinking a lot of grapefruit juice while they're on a, a medication that requires um, 3A4 for metabolism. And then the inducers are listed there. So you can see some of these drugs um, are inhibitors of several enzymes. Um, or inducers of several enzymes. And so we do have a common kind of list in our head about what medications to be a little more aware of when we're thinking about these drug interactions. So I'll go into some common ones that we see in um, oncology. So this is a pretty important um, drug interaction to be aware of. So vincristine and azole antifungals. Um, vincristine metabolism is mediated by 3A4 and also is a substrate of PGP. So triazole antifungals inhibit 3A4, and boriconazole, intraconazole, and posagonazole are very strong inhibitors of 3A4. Fluconazole is a moderate inhibitor, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, intraconazole and posagonazole also inhibit PGP, so what we talked about before, it would allow more drug to be absorbed than, um, it would, than we would expect. 
Um, and what we would see with that is increased toxicity, right? So the bincrystine is not being metabolized and broken down, and potentially with these other medications, more is being absorbed anyway. And so you have some, you could have severe neurotoxicity, so peripheral neuropathy. And then the severe GI symptoms are what we really get concerned about. So this is autonomic neuropathy and could um, present as um, a severe ileus leading to death, which there have been reports of. Um, you could also have electrolyte abnormalities and seizures. So this is a pretty severe um, drug interaction that can come up because um, many patients who are on vincristine, um, namely ALL patients, uh, do end up being on antifungals for um, an invasive fungal infection. So um, when we think about the vincristine um, interaction, um, the reason why there's no case reports on for fluconazole is because it is a moderate inhibitor. So there are different levels of inhibition by medications. And so like I said, voriconazole, posiconazole, and intraconazole are all strong inhibitors. And fluconazole is considered a more moderate inhibitor. So the degree to which the vincristine concentration would be increased by that inhibition is not necessarily clinically significant. And so you can see that the median time to adverse drug interaction is different based on each drug. But the, the um, adverse drug reactions are typically the same between all of these. So you still get all of those types of increased peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy side effects. Um, so the recommendation here would be to use an alternative antifungal agent. Although they're not as convenient because echinocandins or amphotericin are IV medications, it is the safest option for the patient. So you would want to avoid these oral medications. Um, and then if somebody already was diagnosed with invasive fungal infection prior to starting vincristine or any alkaloid for that matter, um, you would want to discontinue the azole antifungal prior to vincristine um, administration and switch them to one of these other alternatives. Um, and, you know, the time to discontinu discontinuation would depend on the half-life of each of the drugs, but it would probably be about at least a week before. Another drug interaction that commonly comes up is actually enzalutamide itself, which is a hormonal that we use for metastatic prostate cancer, and now um, new indication for non-metastatic prostate cancer, is an enzyme inducer itself. So it is a strong inducer of 3A4 and a moderate inducer of these two other enzymes, 2C19 and 2C9. And so um, this comes up a lot because patients um, who have prostate cancer are generally um, older gentlemen, and they have comorbidities, and they're on blood pressure medications, and they're on diabetes medications. And um, if any of those medications are are metabolized by 3A4 and co-administered with enzalutamide, you could see um, it be rendered almost ineffective because you can see here that about 90% of the drug would be um, uh, would be gone after the en enzyme was induced. And then similarly with um, some of these moderate induction, you can see a decrease in the concentrations of the drugs with enzyme induction. So it's really important to kind of be aware of these types of things so that we can evaluate the patient's drug profile and then make some changes up front um, to potentially blood pressure medications or other things, make sure the patient's stable on the new regimen before we start enzalutamide because we want to make sure the patient's not going to develop any kind of adverse event um, with ineffective um, concomitant therapy. And another very important um, enzyme interaction that we see in oncology is uh, tamoxifen and SSRIs. So this is one um, that's been in the literature for a long time. Tamoxifen is actually a prodrug for endoxifen, which is the active metabolite of tamoxifen, and it does require 2D6 for conversion. Now, fluoxetine and peroxetine inhibit 2D6. So basically what that means is that the tamoxifen will not be able to be converted to its active metabolite. And that could lead to, lead to ineffective therapy by um, giving a patient tamoxifen and one of these um, medications at the same time. And you can see that the plasma concentrations of endoxifen were statistically significantly de decreased when um, 
co-administered with paroxetine. And you know, um, a lot of cancer patients have mood disorders, depression, um, trouble coping. So, you know, reaching for one of these common SSRIs makes sense, but you always have to keep in the back of your mind that some of these can come with drug interactions and finding an alternative that will not affect the metabolite, um, the, the active metabolite is, would be important. So I have a, um, our third case here. Um, we have BB is a 39-year-old with new diagnosis B cell ALL. She is being treated with KL, KALGB10403, which includes sonorubicin, vincristine, pegasperdase, and prednisone. She has evidence of an aspergillosis lung infection and needs antifungal therapy. The plan is to discontinue fluconazole, which she had been on for prophylaxis, and start posaconazole. So her current meds are levofloxacin, um, pantoprazole, sertraline, valacyclovir, fluconazole, sofran, and compazine. Um, her labs are listed there. Um, and so with that, we'll go to the question. Again, some of these are lengthy, but I'll read them clearly. So you guys, I just want to make sure that the getting those these main points. Um, so how would you manage BB's vincristine posaconazole drug interaction? Would you A, continue with the recommendation to start posaconazole and monitor closely for toxicity? B, recommend to use an alternative antifungal um, agent as posaconazole inhibits 3A4 and could cause life-threatening toxicity due to increased exposure to vincristine. C, recommend to use an alternative antifungal agent as posaconazole induces 2C9, which would decrease efficacy of vincristine, leading to treatment failure. D, dose reduce vincristine to limit the toxicity associated with the drug interaction. Or E, discontinue vincristine since posicon is all need, is needed to treat aspergillosis. All right, take just another uh, five or 10 seconds, please. All right, Dr. Morgan. How are they doing? Yeah, so the majority of the people did get mm -hmm. the question right, so the answer would be B. Recommend to use an alternative um, antifungal agent since posaconazole does inhibit 3A4 and can cause life-threatening toxicity due to increased in exposure to vincristine. Now, I did think that some people might pick um, D, which um, was reduced dose of vincristine, but um, unfortunately, we don't really have that much data to tell us how much the dose would be, need to be decreased in order to overcome this enzyme inhibition. So there's, we would not know what the effective dose of vincristine would be in the presence of this inhibition. So we would not want to um, change the dose of vincristine. So the appropriate therapy would be to um, pick an ant alternative antifungal agent. All right. Okay. So the, the last um, pharmacokinetic parameter we're going to discuss is excretion. So this is elimination of the drug from the body. Um, there could be several different ways that this can come about. Change in glomerular filtration, um, altered renal tubular reabsorption, changes in renal tubular secretion. There also could be hepatic or renal toxic effects of taking concomitant medications together. So the most relevant and best example of this is high-dose methotrexate. So high-dose methotrexate is, um, or methotrexate is prim primarily eliminated by renal tubular secretion. One of the main drug um, interactions with high-dose methotrexate is NSAIDs. So NSAIDs inhibit tubular secretion of methotrexate. They also reduce the blood flow of the kidneys by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis. So co-administration of NSAIDs can result in um, decreased elimination, which would result in um, increased serum concentrations or prolonged serum concentrations of methotrexate. And that could increase risk of toxicity. Um, the recommendations for this would be to discontinue NSAIDs prior to methotrexate infusion and avoid NSAIDs during the time the patients will be getting it. So patients usually get high-dose methotrexate and within a week their um, methotrexate levels are clear. So it, if somebody was using NSAIDs, it would just be for a short period of time until their next cycle. So they don't have to avoid it during their entire course of methotrexate, but just during the time that it's being administered. And there are several um, interactions that are kind of similar with high-dose methotrexate. So PPIs also should be avoided with high-dose methotrexate. Um, inhibition of the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump in the um, tubules of the kidney 
um, can be inhibited by PPIs and um, inhibit the secretion of methotrexate. It also can inhibit this breast cancer um, resistance protein that's in, found in the kidney that's also um, involved in methotrexate secretion. So again, this would prolong the methotrexate concentrations in the blood um, and increase toxicity. Again, you can see myelosuppression, mucositis, nephrotoxicity, all of the toxicities are not listed there um, because you could have hepatotoxicity, neurotoxicity. High dose methotrexate comes with lots of um, toxicities, especially with prolonged exposure. And so again, the recommendation would be to discontinue PPIs several days prior to administration of methotrexate. And just a couple other examples, like I said, I could go on about drug interactions with high-dose methotrexate, but these are also pretty pertinent when patients are admitted for this drug, is sulfonamide, so Bactrim. Um, many uh, or most uh, patients receiving high-dose methotrexate are also concomitantly on Bactrim for PJP prophylaxis. Um, because they're getting treated for lymphoma. So, um, and there's a couple of things here I think that are important. So, um, displacement of methotrexate from protein binding is a potential mechanism for this. So, that's what we talked about earlier where you have the distribution drug interaction. Then you have inhibition of renal tubular secretion, um, so excretion. And then additive antifolate effects. We haven't talked about pharmacodynamics yet, but we will shortly. And so, the additive effect of the antifolate could potential potentiate bone marrow toxicity. So again, we would want to avoid concomitant use of this medication. What we do here is actually dose spectrum on Saturday and Sunday of um, every week so that when they are admitted for their high dose methotrexate, hopefully they have already taken their spectrum and um, it would not be an issue. And then the lastly is penicillin. So again, interference with methotrexate tubular secretion. Um, there has been toxicity reported with several different types of penicillins. Obviously, sometimes you have to treat pen with penicillins based on what type of infection they have. And so it's important to just evaluate the patient. Um, you would try to avoid it, but you can just closely monitor methotrexate levels. And if you see that a patient's secretion of methotrexate is being prolonged based on their um, methotrexate levels, then you might want to start looking for an alternative therapy um, besides penicillins. Okay, so now we're going into, we kind of completed our, our pharmacokinetics, now we're going to move forward with pharmacodynamic drug interactions. So this is how dr two drugs can affect the body. Um, so the mechanism of action of multiple drugs can influence the same physiological process. And these can be additive, synergistic, or antagonistic. And some of the more common um, effects of pharmacodynamic interactions are CNS interactions. So you can imagine several CNS depressive medications um, taking them at the same time. GI interactions, this could be, for example, taking NSAIDs and steroids that can increase your risk for a GI ulcer. And then QT prolongation. So many of the medications that we take um, or that cancer patients take have the potential to prolong the QT. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about that. So QT prolongation is definitely an additive toxicity. Um, Torsad's point is more likely to occur when the QTC is greater than 500 milliseconds. And um, the incidence is pretty low, but there are some special considerations in oncology patients. So if patients have prolonged QT at baseline, um, that could be a consideration for kind of close monitoring when adding other medications that can potentially prolong the QT. Um, general risk factors like older age, underlying coronary disease, and previous my myocardial infarction, you might want to pay more closer attention to those patients. And then also cancer-related risk factors, so altered drug clearance, maybe they're on two medications that potentially can cause QT prolongation that are also eliminated by the kidney, and they have a little bit of kidney dysfunction, you know, that might be a little more concerning. Um, low electrolyte levels, and then obviously multiple offending medications would be, um, uh, would warrant more close monitoring. So again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but just to give you some common medications that we use in oncology that could prolong the QT interval. So many of the tyrosine kinase um, inhibitors are implicated in QT prolongation. Azole antifungals, 5-HT3 antagonists, so our antiemetics that we often use in most patients that are um, 
have cancer for nausea management. Then you have fluoroquinolones and other macrolide antibiotics. So you can imagine that maybe a patient would be on almost one of each of these medications. They could be on a, a TKI. Um, maybe they have thrush, so we started them on fluconazole. And they're nauseous, so they're on Zofran. And maybe they, you know, have a pneumonia, so we put them on levofloxacin. So that would be four drugs right there that could potentially have an additive toxicity for QT prolongation. And so the recommendation would basically just to be, you know, more uh, cognizant about a patient's risk factors. Obviously, if a patient doesn't have any risk factors, you know, monitoring the QT, I'm not recommending getting an EKG on every cancer patient. But if they do have some risk factors, a baseline EKG might be beneficial. And then um, if you're starting a bunch of concomitant medications that require, um, that can prolong the QT, doing some follow-up EKGs just to make sure that we're still safe with the patient would be important. Um, obviously, the clinical concern would be when the QT pro is prolonged greater than 500 milliseconds or there's a large change from baseline. And monitoring and replacing electrolytes is important. So having low potassium, low magnesium, low calcium can increase your risk of torsades. So we want to be making sure that we're kind of on top of those as well in a patient that we do have concern for. So this is uh, another case for you guys. Um, JV is a 67-year-old female with renal cell carcinoma, currently on pizopinib, 800 milligrams daily. She presents to clinic after being diagnosed with pneumonia at her PCP three days ago. She was prescribed levofloxacin, 500 milligrams daily for 10 days. Um, so her past medical history is hypothyroidism and hypertension. She has um, Synthroid, Amlodipine, Lisinopril, Zofran, and a multivitamin. And you can see her baseline labs there, um, potassium of 3.2, magnesium 1.8. And her most recent EKG two months ago was had a calculated um, QT of 470. So the question being, an EKG was performed in the clinic and the QTC is 505. How would you manage JV's QTC prolongation at this time? So A, discontinue levofloxacin and provide alternative therapy to a treat pneumonia. Um, B, instruct the patient to stop using Zofran and provide alternative therapy for nausea. C, replace potassium. Having low potassium increases your risk of torsades. Um, D, A and B, or E, all of the above. All right. Well, lots of answers. Uh, yeah. How are they doing? Um, they're doing good. I mean, so the an the correct answer is all of the above. Okay. So you would definitely want to discontinue the levofloxacin this time. Um, mm -hmm. Provide an alternate therapy for the um, nausea because um, the Zofran can't potentially cause a prolongation in the QT. And then the potassium was low, so we do want to replace that to decrease the risk of torsades. So um, the answer would be all of the above. You know, the one thing we want to try to do, try not to do, is um, discontinue the cancer therapy. So pisopinib does have the um, risk of prolonging the QT, but since the patient was stable on that prior to starting these additional medications, um, we would assume that removing these offending agents could potentially put them back into a safe zone. And, um, you know, if we repeat it again, it's still prolonged, the potential is we might have to hold the cancer therapy. So um, we want to try to mitigate that as much as possible by making these interventions with the drug interactions. All right. And just a reminder to our audience, in just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to share your questions with Dr. Morgan. So if you'll have those ready, we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Okay. So just to wrap up, I, I do have a quick note about herbal supplements. Um, I could probably talk an hour about herbal supplements, but I just wanted to bring everyone's attention. Um, you know, there are potential for cancer therapy and herb interactions. There are no real clinical studies conducted to evaluate herbal effects on drugs. So it's important to just keep in mind that they can affect the PK and PD of antineoplastic drugs. And what we need to do or what we do practically is use the mechanisms and side effect reports of the herbal supplements to kind of predict potential compounded toxicity um, or an effect on the cancer therapy's effectiveness. And, you know, these medications are typically unregulated. They have unpredictable effects on cancer therapy, and there are uncertain side effect profile. Um, so we just need to be kind of vigilant about what patients are taking that we're not prescribing. 
And some examples, just a couple examples, so you have phytoestrogens that are mimic estradiol. They can actually stimulate the growth of breast cancer cells um, and decrease the effectiveness of tamoxifen. And so we would typically want to avoid those types of medication or supplements in hormone-sensitive cancers. And then you have antioxidants. So this is a huge, like, controversial topic, right? I could probably go on for a long time about antioxidants. But one thing we do theoretically know is that, you know, some of our um, med chemotherapies, anthracyclines, platinum compounds, do create reactive oxygen species for their effectiveness. So taking a compound that's considered to have antioxidant pro properties could potentially decrease the effectiveness of these chemotherapies. And then they should, it should generally be avoided, especially in these medications that are relying on the development of reactive oxygen species for their um, um, cytotoxic effects. So another large topic, preventing drug interactions, but I do just want to touch on it briefly before we conclude. So there are diff different strategies. We do have the drug interaction alerts at um, CPOE. I know you guys are all very familiar with these and probably annoyed by most of them because the alerts do come up quite often. Um, we also have drug interaction alerts um, past the point of entry upon pharmacist verification. And um, med, med reconciliation is very important. So we talked about herbal supplements over the counter. So making sure we have a full, complete list of patients who um, medications patients are taking. There's also advent, adverse event reporting through FDA MedWatch that allows um, practitioners to real time report um, adverse events, whether that's from a drug not reported before or because of a drug interaction. And then just screening our high-risk patients. So we know patients on lots of medications, probably older patients who are taking many medications. It's important to kind of keep track and make sure we're really looking at their drugs closely. And um, one drawback of it, like I mentioned before, is alert fatigue. So there is a lot of alerts that come up when we order medications. And the ISMP does have recommendations for that. So if you guys do notice that there are, you know, invalid or not or insignificant warnings that keep coming up, we need to know about it um, or your health safety, medication safety officer does because um, that way they can modify those to make sure only the most pertinent alerts are being um, provided to you guys. So with that, I'll kind of wrap things up. Uh, we talked a lot about different drug interactions and the importance of understanding the narrow therapeutic index of these medications um, and, you know, could lead to decreased efficacy or increased toxicity. Um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are um, important to understand. And the management of drug interactions can, in, can um, include a variety of things from close monitoring to avoiding um, a drug class altogether. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions that anyone has regarding this presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you do have questions, so please go ahead and share those with Dr. Morgan. Uh, those are a few of uh, the responses coming in, okay. so apologies to anyone who responded D or B, but your questions will show up next. I have a few to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's the role of the patient, and this is kind of a two-part one. First off, what's the, the role of the patient in terms of identifying mm -hmm. potential drug interactions and reporting those uh, to the clinicians? And then combined with that, is there a role for, for some of the work being done with patient reported outcomes, Dr. Bosch and others are doing, and how that might fit in with, with the patients uh, sharing their interact what, what they may perceive as, as drug interactions? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the most important thing to think about from a patient perspective is mm -hmm. always having an accurate drug list with you mm -hmm. and including herbal supplements or taking over-the-counter medications and any, any medications that are prescribed outside of the oncologist's office. You know, sometimes we don't have access to those. Mm -hmm. And so um, reporting mm -hmm. your medication list every time you come, any changes you've made, as small as they can be, um, mm -hmm. are important for us as practitioners to make sure there are no new interactions that have come up since the last visit. Now, I mean, there is in resources online as well. Um, for herbal supplements, I, MSK has a really good um, online database mm -hmm. that can be used to look at, you know, are there drug interactions, what are the toxicities of those drugs, and that's one that I use myself. And then um, just being kind of in tune with the with your clinic and make sure that, um, you know, if you are concerned about a drug interaction, please let us know, and we'll be more than happy to address it. 
Great. And, and I guess as a follow-up to that, speaking of patients and keeping lists, uh, we've, we've had a presentation here about uh, patients using cannabis mm -hmm. to, uh, to treat side effects. Yes. Um, are there, are there concerns, and, and so a bit, sort of two part, are there concerns about cannabis and interactions there? And then if so, how would you uh, present this in a way that the, that the patient would feel comfortable sharing that information with you? Yeah, so medical, um, you know, medical necessity of marijuana, there are lots of data about mm -hmm. nausea and appetite. I think outside of those two things, the data becomes more fuzzy. Mm -hmm. um, but there are potential um, adverse of things that could happen to somebody who was smoking marijuana. I, you know, from a drug perspective on drug interactions, it would have to be a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people who are immunocompromised and smoking marijuana, marijuana has lots of molds in it. So potentially you could, um, you know, develop a mold infection by smoking marijuana when you have an, an immunocompromised state. Um, that doesn't really have anything with drug interactions, but it is like, sure, you know, there sure. are concerns with yeah. smoking marijuana in the oncology patient in general. Right, right. So, so trying to get patients then to, to open and, up you know, and, and share And, you know, being open about mm -hmm. that is very important because, mm -hmm. you know, all, as oncologists and oncology practitioners, we're open to talking about lots of different therapies for patients to make them feel better mm -hmm. and um, open to the discussion. So it's always help, beneficial to know what you're taking than kind of keeping it um, to yourself. Right. All right, thank you. We've got a, a question here. A uh, student here, I imagine different CYP genetic variants may metabolize chemo drugs differently. How much do we know about that? Do we consider the different CYP genetic variants when calculating the chemo uh, dose for patients? Yes, yeah, so this is a really good question. And, you know, this could also be an hour lecture mm -hmm. on um, me metabolite, um, metabolism variation between patients. Um, I didn't touch on it today because it doesn't necessarily have much to do with drug in drug interactions. But, yes, yeah, so um, patients, there's interpatient variability about um, the um, effective or the um, – um, the way that people's enzymes metabolize medications. Um, there's not a lot of data to uh, provide dose recommendations just based on the variance of the metabolism. Now, some drugs do have dose recommendations based on if you're taking like a strong 3A4 inhibitor or inducer, then the drug companies have provided dose recommendations for to overcome some of that. Um, so when I mentioned earlier that being Christine, we didn't know it hadn't been studied. But some of these new oral agents, they do have dose recommendations for if a patient is taking a concomitant um, medication that may affect the metabolism of the drug, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as genetic variations, um, there currently is not um, a lot of data to suggest if a patient is a poor metabolizer or a super metabolizer of a drug that we're going to increase or decrease the dose by this much. And that's kind of a, a whole other topic, to be honest. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, let's see. So we have just a, a minute or two left. If you'd like to submit a question, uh, I've got one that's that's fairly topical. So yeah. uh, New England Journal of Medicine a week ago released a study talking about uh, dementia the, and and a prevalence of dementia up to fifty percent mm -hmm. in patients going to the ICU. Do we do we have any sense of what number of patients might uh, oncology patients might go to the ICU as a result of of drug interactions? No, so I, I don't have that number. I would mm -hmm. imagine it's similar to um, or close to the number of patients that we discussed earlier, like developing adverse effects, probably mm -hmm. like 20%, not ICU, but mm -hmm. maybe, you know, 20% of patients do end up having additional interventions, clinic right. visits. Um, I know I add on clinic visits to see patients who are having adverse events to their chemotherapy all the time outside of right. their normal visits with their oncologist. Sure, sure. So that adds a clinic visit. Um, and then some patients do end up getting admitted. So I don't have the hard numbers for okay. that, but I'll probably okay. estimate about 20%. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any Anything that you'd like to say in closing? No, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I really appreciated you all um, participating in the questions, and um, it seemed like everybody was listening, which is always a good thing. All right. Absolutely. Well, let me just say a few things. We want to thank uh, you, Dr. Morgan. We want to thank the uh, UCRF. Uh, University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and the North Carolina uh, General Assembly for their generous funding of both. Uh, we want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work that they do for this and every one of our lectures. 
Uh, coming up, uh, we have a medical and surgical oncology lecture on October 24th at noon, and that's aerobic and resistance exercise in cancer patients, methods and benefits with uh, Dr. Bataglini and Dr. Wood, uh, then an RN and allied health lecture on November 14th at noon, and that's caring for adolescents and young adults living with cancer, meeting their unique medical and uh, psychosocial needs with Lauren Lux. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for both of those. Uh, we do have more self-paced online courses available, and we'll just keep adding those. Uh, but, but we do have uh, more that we add every month, so you can take those, including this one, for up to a year after the lecture has occurred. So if you missed this, or if you had a colleague that missed this, let her or him know about this. They can go about two weeks after the lecture and uh, um, take those. And uh, then we are very excited, uh, starting with our November 28th lecture, to add ACPE uh, continuing education credit for pharmacists. Great. We're really sorry we weren't <laughs> able to, to do that in time for this lecture, okay. but starting with, uh, with our November 28th lecture, also our December 12th and December 19th lectures, as well as the first two lectures in January, will all include ACPE uh, credit. So we'll do that for as many as we can. We're excited to be able to add that feature. Uh, so please uh, spread the word to your uh, pharmacist colleagues, and, uh, and those are, of course, all free. All of this credit is free. So, all right, I think that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can get back with us uh, online at, by emailing us unccn at unc.edu, calling us 919-445-1000, find us on the web, unccn.org, and this presentation will be added to the over 200 presentations already online at our site. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here. Of course.